Okay. So shortly after the Royal Irish, you joined the ARRC. Could you explain what they do? It's the Ace Rapid Reaction Corps. Um, it's a it's a corps headquarters um, that is uh, that is directly responsible to the Supreme Allied Commander Europe as part of NATO. It is NATO's um, reaction force, Ace Rapid Reaction Corps, um, that has up to four divisions from different countries, including an English division or a British division. And if if NATO was involved in conflict, conflict anywhere, the Ace Rapid Reaction Corps would deploy with those divisions. Um, they deployed in Bosnia, uh, which I uh, wasn't with them then, but they also deployed to Kosovo, and I was with them then, and we had... Uh, we had divisions, or, or small divisions in some cases, from France, um, Britain, Germany, and the United States. And we went into Kosovo and uh, did what needed doing. So, what type of things did you do in Kosovo? Um, well, the first thing we had to do was, uh, because of the United Nations resolution, was ensure that all Serbian forces left. Um, we then had to restore law and order, which is not a military task, it's a police task and then really help rebuild the country. Can we stop? I'm going to have to... Just take it. Oh, yeah. So, what was it like in Kosovo? What did you do in Kosovo? Um, well, first of all, we had to um, uh, make sure that the Serb forces left as per the United Nations resolution, and that wasn't particularly easy. Um, in fact, let's go back to the very beginning. Um, what did we do in Kosovo? We deployed for forward um, to Macedonia and coordinated the unfortunate bombing campaign that ultimately forced the um, Serbian pres president to uh, with agree to withdraw from Kosovo. Once he agreed to do that, we then had to move in with NATO troops and ensure that, that his forces had withdrawn, not just his military forces, but his special police forces, um, called the MUP. Don't ask me to say what that is in, in, in Yugoslavia because it's very similar to Martian, the way it's spoken. Um, we then had to disarm the, um, the UCK. These were the, some people call them freedom fighters, some people call them terrorists, that were um, fighting to protect the Alba ethnic Albanians in Kosovo. We then had to restore law and order, which is not a military task, it's a police task, but we had virtually no policemen to help us. Um, and we then had to set the conditions for the ethnic Albanians to take control of the country and rebuild its institutions, uh, law and order, um, courts, industry, commerce, trade. Not a military task, but we did it. Okay. So you said at the start of this, um, you work with a lot of different countries. Did you find this harder than it would be working with, like, a country just just your own country. Oh yeah, of course. Um, you, they have different armies, different cultures. Um, there are there are NATO standard procedures. And so if you're going to do write an op order, there is a standard format, and all the countries are trained to that format. But there are there are each of these countries are very different in, in temperament, in training, in capability. And it would be unfair of me to, to name a particular country, but that would be, not be fair. But you could tell a staff officer from another country, do this, thinking he would do it the same as a British officer, and he would do it completely differently. So you, you really, you couldn't give the latitude or freedom of action and use of initiative that you would expect of a British officer to, to, to some of the nations that were involved in NATO. So planning and, and distributing orders and ensuring that things were done correctly was quite difficult at times, but it's going to be like that in a multinational force. You know, we're all different. We're all different. And yes, it, of course, it's much easier when you just deploy as a national element. Okay, so in 1991 to 2001, you was Colonel acting as Deputy Commander in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. What role did you play as that? Um, I was the Deputy Brigade Commander. Um, so. Um, my, first, my, my main task was to de de stand in for the brigade commander when he was out of out of area or on leave, and the other the other tasks I I, I had were, were mainly related to liaison with the special branch, 
and the administration of the brigade. Now, if you tell a brigade to go to war, there is a lot that goes with that, you know, f fuel, rations, ammunition. Um, and in, in, that, in Northern Ireland's case, because the families were over there, if the men were deployed, you have the families to look after and their welfare, the children's welfare. So if you like, all the things that enable the men to go and do their operations. So would you say it was harder when you was a um, colonel than when it, you was captain before? That's a really interesting question. Um, my own view is the more senior you get, the easier your job is. And the reason for that is that when you're a captain, everything comes to you and you've got nobody to farm the work out. The more senior you get, and as a colonel in, in that brigade, I had something like um, two lieutenant colonels, six majors, ten captains and about 30 senior NCOs. So if I had something to do, I would just farm the work out. Um, the only difficult bit is, is, is making sure that you've got the resources and that the plan, that the, the, the end state and the plans you're giving them are achievable. You know, because you've got all that experience behind you, it actually is easier the more senior you get. Okay. So, um, after Northern Ireland, you were as Assistant Chief of Staff in Cyprus. What does this mean and what did you actually do out there? Um, the Assistant Chief of Staff ran all operations on the island of Cyprus. Um, and Cyprus is a base that uh, is very important to Britain. Um, it's, it's got a port that our ships can come into. It's got a massive airfield that our planes can come into. It's location, uh, i.e. in the uh, east of the Mediterranean, sits quite nicely in, a, in an area that w w was de de destable, was, was um, unstable then and continues to be unstable. So it sits just off the co coast of Beirut and has fantastic access into all of the Middle East countries where there is still conflict going on. Um, within three or four months of arriving, we started to prepare for the um, in um, invasion of Iraq under Gulf War II, so my entire time was spent planning that operation. Was it dangerous out there? No. no. We, had, we had some riots, and you know, but no, not really. Okay. Probably more dangerous walking through, uh, walking through parts of London late at night. So you went out to Bosnia. What role did you play out there? Uh, Kosovo. Um, that, uh, sorry, but, um, where are we on my, my career? Bosnia. Um, no, I was in Bosnia long before I went to uh, to Cyprus. I went to Bosnia as a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel in 1994, and I was the military assistant to the chief of staff of the United Nations force in Bosnia. Um, and what did that entail? The chief of staff is responsible to the general for all of the military operations. So I helped the chief of staff produce all the planning and, uh, and operations for what the United Nations were doing in Bosnia, which included at that stage the handover to NATO after the atrocities at Gorazda and Srebrenica. So what was the climate like out there? The climate in terms of weather? Yeah. It was very hot in the summer and really cold in the winter. So how did you cope with that? Um, well, for, you, you, if you're out in the car, I, I went out to, to, I went out there in their autumn, which was much the same as autumn here, a little bit warmer. The winters are savagely cold and there's lots of snow, but of course if you are out there for a period and you've got time to acclimatise, and of course British Army issue fantastic kit, so the, the weather is, is, is never really a problem. Yes, it can be uncomfortable, but you're, you're trained how to look after yourself in the cold. You're, you're taught about uh, uh, how, to, uh, how to operate in the heat, and, to, and, and that is, again, about uh, understanding water intake, understanding the need for brakes. Um, so, no, the weather, the weather wasn't a problem. So, what was the most memorable part of your tour out there? In Bosnia? Yeah. Um, that the United Nations mission um, ended and the NATO mission came in because the United Nations were never able to properly prevent some of the atrocities that were happening there um, because of rules of engagement and the United Nations force is not a combat force, it's a peacekeeping force and Bosnia needed peacemaking and that involved um, highly equipped armies basically saying you either do it 
otherwise you'll suffer the consequences. But there, there was um, terrible genocide in Bosnia over that period, as you probably know. Okay. So in 2005, you were a brigadier in Bosnia. What did you do differently out there? Oh, right. Now we've skipped a bit. Okay, yeah. Um, I commanded a multinational brigade in Bosnia as part of the NATO um, peacekeeping force. I had um, soldiers from Britain, Holland, um, Switzerland, and an air group in Switzerland, uh, Romania. So it was a it was a multinational force, and uh, and my role was um, to look after the Serbian part of, of Bosnia to ensure that they demilitarized. Um, to ensure that the army, the Bosnian army, not Serbian army, that was being rebuilt, um, understood its role, um, became multicultural, and looked to support Bosnia as a whole and not just the the Serb piece in there. Um, we were also involved in countering serious crime um, at that time, and I don't know about now because I'm out of date. A lot of um, a lot of the drugs that were end, ending up on the streets in, 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 in London and Paris and Berlin were being laundered through Bosnia, so uh, we acted as, as, if you like, policemen. But uh, the reason it, the army had to be involved is because these gangs were massively well armed and the police weren't always capable of doing it. We also, um, we also tackled um, illegal, illegal logging, which you may think of this may, that's a strange task. Well. Bosnia is a country that is absolutely covered in, in woodland and a lot of it is hardwood and very, very valuable. And uh, Ill illegal logging operations were literally cutting down thousands of acres of Bosnian woodland that really should have been government controlled to, 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 to be used to help build the economy. So we stopped them as well. 